Hello, listeners. Yamina here. Welcome to the Dr. GPCR podcast. I'm very excited to bring you brand new episodes. To start, I had the pleasure of hosting Dr. Richard Primont. First, we discussed his career trajectory and then moved on to record a series of episodes in which he shared the history of the significant discoveries that shaped our field. I had such a great time chatting with Dr. Primont. I hope you'll have as much fun listening. Before we dive into this episode, I would like to take a moment to thank our Dr. GPCR ecosystem partners, Domain Therapeutics, GPCR Therapeutics, Design Pharmaceuticals, Montana Molecular, and Orion Biotechnology. Please mark your calendar for our next symposium held on Friday, November 17th, on the topic of GPCRs in immuno-oncology. The symposium is free, but you must be a Dr. GPCR ecosystem member, which is also free. For our last event of the year, we will be hosting a roundtable and discuss GPCRs and their role in immunology and oncology and current therapeutic modalities in this context. The GPCR retreat is coming up November 2nd to the 4th. Although registration is closed, the organizers are looking for the event's next logo. Please visit gpcrretreat.org and get more details on the logo contest. Wouldn't it be fun to have your design associated with this iconic meeting? And now, let's dive into this episode. Hello, everyone. This is Yamina from Dr. GPCR, and I'm very excited to have back with us again, Dr. Richard Provence. Today, we're going to be talking about history, history of our field. Richard, welcome back. Thank you. It's great to be back. Um, yeah, so last time we kind of talked about the history of GPCRs through the vision of G proteins, and that, that's, that was for a reason. Um, people didn't realize it was a coherent field, right, until... Yeah. The beta receptor was cloned, and then beta receptor looks like rhodopsin. All the receptors must look like this, right? That was the, yeah. the immediate implication. Um, but once that happened, now all these people who had been working on their, you know, whatever part of endocrinology they're working on with their hormone, suddenly realize, hey, we're working on the same thing. So suddenly there's a field. And here we yeah. are. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm very curious. I, I don't know if it's, it's planned into, into the discussion today, but I'm very curious to hear about, I, I know that for a long time, we were able to measure the consequences of receptor activation, but they were not called receptors. Some people were saying, oh, it doesn't exist. Things just diffuse and the cells respond. Mm -hmm. um, what was that like? That's really kind of before my own personal time. <laughs> I figured. <laughs> so, I mean, it, when when I started in GPCRs was 1985. And so the cloning of beta receptor was 86. So one of the first projects I worked on myself was looking at, we, we, the lab was trying to purify the glucagon receptor. Mm -hmm. And we had a photo affinity ligand. So we would bind it to membranes and then zap it with UV light and then run it on a gel. And then you you know, so you get like a 65 kilodalton band, of course, because it's a you know normal size receptor. And you could cut it with an endonuclease to get rid of the sugars. You could cut it with proteases and get these different fragments. Um, and yeah, so we had a, we had a paper on all the different, so we knew it was, there's a physical thing and it, we, were, we were hardly the first one. So lots of people had done the same kind of thing mm -hmm. with their receptors. So there was no, there was no doubt. There was one protein that was binding to your hormone, yeah, on on a cell membrane. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think I think it's a it's a fascinating the stories that you told last time around G proteins and the aluminum and this the I I had the opportunity to talk to different people and I took the opportunity to tell them this story because I think it's a really interesting and 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 cool story behind it. Not a lot of people. As of the November second, people will know, will know yeah. more about it. Uh, but it's very interesting. But if so, you find yourself talking to some of these, you know, some of the people that had were there at the time, I, you've you've not talked to people like you know Elliot Ross or Paul Sternweiss. Yeah. You have talked to Paul Insel. Yes, and he's got a lot of you know his his perspective on what was going on. So, so there are a lot of things that that some of the older folks were involved in that I'm telling the story of. So I wasn't necessarily yeah. involved. Yeah, but you you may talk to some of these people in the future, and you know, so now you got. You know, a teaser to <laughs> yes, <laughs> I know what to what to where yeah. to direct the conversation. Right. All right. So, uh, tell us a little bit more about. Um. Okay. So let's see. What do I mean? So. 
so basically yeah so in the beginning right was was the beta receptor well actually the beta receptor was second and actually um Lefkowitz at one point gave us gave a talk the importance of being second okay and, and you see the importance of being second you know with with one rhodopsin you know here, here's a receptor and it's a squiggly snake looking thing and that's great um but you don't get any general information but with two now immediately there's a pattern right so now you can yeah. see oh receptors look like this um exactly. and, and for the first several years that's what receptors looked like right so all of the first receptors that were then sequenced and cloned whether it was you know from purification or as, as you know, homology sequencing started to happen um they all look like this right so it was it was family a was the only thing there was for several years right so just so kind of bear that in mind so so i kind of thought you know do, something to kind of think about as, as a thought experiment. So as it turns out, right, the first GPCR to be identified, sequenced, was Rhodopsin. And it was not cloned. It was actually purified and then chopped into pieces with proteases. And those protease fragments, the little peptides, were then sequenced by Edmund degradation. So no mass spec. This is the old, the old fashioned way where you chop off one amino acid at a time and detect what amino acid is. It had been sequenced from end to end. It was known to be palmitylated. Um, by 1983, right, by, by two different groups, one Paul Hargrave in the United States and Yuri Avchinikov uh, in Russia and Moscow. And there's a paper by Paul Hargrave in 1983 where it's like, okay, here it is. We finally, you know, we had pieces of it, bits of sequence. Now we've, we've got the whole thing end to end and it has the very first GPCR snake. <laughs> and the funny thing is the visual people, you know, so, so we think about the surface of a cell, right? So we're on the outside, so receptors are always facing from our perspective up, where the ligand comes in from the outside. In a in a rod outer segment, the it's it, it's actually a vesicle that's flattened. So they actually the first snake and and the visual people always do this. They put Rhodopsin upside down from our perspective, yeah. <laughs> right? Because yeah, the, the the amino terminus is inside the vesicle, which is topologically outside the cell. But yeah. anyway, they, they always make it upside down. Anyway, but, but that's that's the first receptor snake diagram that we've all mm -hmm. seen so many of, right? Um, so anyway, so once you had two, right? So now, now you can see the pattern there that, that there, there's probably all of these receptors are going to be just like this. And it really kind of crystallized the way people thought about receptors. And now all the people that were working on, you know, ACTH and TSH and, you know, whatever endocrine hormone they're working on, um, all those things that were known to be able to stimulate adenyl cyclase and therefore probably went through this G protein NS or GS, yeah. they probably all look like this, right? Yeah. Um, didn't turn out to be true, right? But that, that came later. So the interesting kind of thought experiment is what if one of the other receptors, what if, you know, the secretin receptor or the metabotropic glutamate receptor had been found as a second one? You'd say, gee, receptors have seven transmembrane spans but boy, do they look different. And the field wouldn't have done this coalescence quite as, as much as it did, I think. It, you know, so it's kind of interesting to think about what, what, what if. And, and a lot of those receptors, the first, you know, the secretin receptor was cloned first in family B. It was cloned functionally, right? It was never purified. It's a peptide receptor. They're a pain yeah. in the <laughs> yes. rear to purify. So it was never purified. Um, and it was it was cloned by function. And the way it was cloned is really kind of kind of wacky. What they did was um, had, a, had a cDNA library from a tissue that expressed the receptor. And they took it in business days when the libraries were in viruses. And they broke it down into little pools of like 20,000 clones in a pool. And then they took each of those pools, amplified them separately, and then used them to put in, you know, and then make the, make the plasmid out of it and then put it into COS seven cells, right? Um, and then did binding assays on the cells. <laughs> wow. And they did this pool after pool after pool until they found one pool where the binding went up. And then from that pool, now they subdivided the viruses into pools of 100 or 200, did it again, found the positive pool, and kept subdividing until they had one. And when they had the one, then you could sequence it, and it had seven transmembrane spans, and that's great. No homology <laughs> to Rhodopsin or the beta receptor or many of the other receptors that were known at that time. And that so that's 1991, right? So it took 
several years before people got around to, to, to cloning that. And in the meantime, people have been cloning all these other receptors by homology to the beta receptor, but they weren't finding any of what, you know, the gut brain peptides, right? So glucagon, secretin, mm-hmm. uh, GLP-1, which is, you know, famous now diabetic yes. and obesity drug. Yeah. You know, all, all, the, all, these, all these known hormones, they're all known to go through G proteins. They all activate cyclic AMP through adenylocyclase. Nobody had cloned any of them until this. And now suddenly it's like, oh, that's why, <laughs> right? Because they, they, they're, they're functionally different. So now there's a second class. And now that was the entry point that allowed the cloning of all of the other members of that family. Mm-hmm. Also in 1991, um, the metapotropic glutamate receptor was cloned functionally. Um, and what they did was um, express, basically take a, a library the same way, but instead of transfecting cells and doing binding, they made the plasmids and then used it to make artificial RNA, transcribing it with like T7 polymerase, and then took that and injected it into Xenopus oocytes and then screened the oocytes for currents, right? Um, and then they were able to clone metabolic glutamate receptor one. We know there are, there are lots of them, but that was, that was one. Um, and then of course the other glutamate receptors followed. But interestingly in that family, it, it turns out that a lot of the other receptors were not done by homology. They also were functionally cloned. Um, so the GABA B receptor was also cloned functionally, um, same kind of technique, um, several years, several years later. And then the taste receptors also were, were cloned, not functionally, but by a, a subtractive hybridization technique between taste bud tissue and, and tongue tissue to identify clones that were different, right? Something I actually tried myself and, and, and failed at, but <laughs> Charlie Zucker's lab got it to work. And that, so that, so that's where family C comes from and then the 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 family f guys you know the frizzled and smoothened Mm. um come from drosophila genetics and those were identified as genes in drosophila that had defects in development right so in wing development and you know all the the funny names you know smoothened and patched and frizzled and wingless all these these disheveled they all come from the flies just look weird the the embryos are all weird and they have Mm -hmm. things out of place um and so those were cloned genetically, um, kind of the, the old new fashioned genetic way. And the Drosophila ones were actually cloned first. Um, and of course, their function had been defined genetically too, right? So we know that that frizzled, they, so basically in Drosophila, there's a, there's a ligand called wingless, which we in mammals we call wint, and there are lots of wints, but there's only one wingless in Drosophila. Yes. And there's one frizzled receptor, but in humans, there are lots of them. And so it's a, it's a complicated mess. That's fun to yes. <laughs> try and find out. It um, is. <laughs> but anyway, so they're, they're only, they're only the, the ligand and the, and the receptor in Drosophila. Um, but their signaling pathway is not, the canonical signal pathway has nothing to do with GPCRs. It has, you know, it's got this protein disheveled and it, it, it does completely different things. We now know that there's kind of G protein in there. And it, you know, it can bind to restins, it can get, you know, GRKs are in there. It, 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 it is a member of the family, right? But at the time, there was no, no inkling that this receptor had anything to do with traditional kind of GPCRs. And it was, you know, cloned as a, by complementation, you know, as a gene. And lo and behold, it has seven transmembrane spans and looks like nothing. Um, so, and then smoothing the same kind of thing. And it, it happened to look like the frizzles, roughly speaking. Um, and again, it's, it's traditional signaling meth- mechanism, you know, it's, it's hedgehog and it's got patched and it's got all these other, other proteins that have nothing to do with GPCRs. But again, there's a whole subfield in the GPCR world looking at how these oddball receptors in mammals actually do. Some of their function does go through traditional canonical G protein, arrestin, GRK, all, all those kinds of good, good guys. Um, so, so basically, yeah. So if, if, if any of those receptors had been found first, <laughs> the, the field would have been very, very different, I think, just because it's kind of, you wouldn't have had that, that instant defining moment that said, aha, now, now there's yeah. a field. Now we're, yeah. well, we think we're working on different things, but we're really working on mm-hmm. sub parts of the same thing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You're right. When you think about, you know, the frizzles and the smooth and then and the adhesion GPCRs and the, t- mm. you know, all of these very, very interesting yet non-traditional, let's call them uh, GPCRs. Just thinking about it, I don't know if 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 the field would be what it is today. Then again, I think it took a long time 
to, you know, develop the tools to then study these these GPCRs, frizzles and smoothens. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And um, you know, in some ways, we're lucky well, even the, that even the traditional ones are their tools now that exactly back in the day that make life a lot, you know, a we're lot not easier. The columns anymore. We're not, you know. <laughs> I know. I know. You, you love Brett, you know, now you can do all the Brett biosensor assays and yeah, sure it's absolutely, absolutely. I mean, just thinking about the columns and purifying cyclic AMP and then uh and yeah, and I think my biggest issue with it was always that I wanted to test more conditions than the number of columns I had. So I always had to use the reductionist approach is what is the minimum uh, uh condition. Yeah, this, when, in grad school, this is what my lab did. So <laughs> we had 250 or 300 columns, something like that. So you could, <laughs> you could do big assays. Yeah. Which, which is why my boss always complained. I was always labeling. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's that aspect too, when you're labeling tools and then you need to have the correct marker because once you label it and you smudge the thing with your finger, then you have to go back and relabel, you know, uh, the pleasures of doing basic biochemistry. Right. So, yeah. So I wanted to get back into some kind of basic biochemistry as it were. So, um, so last time when we were talking, we we're talking, you know, we, we kind of we, was framing the 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 quest to find the G proteins as a race, and in in that race there there are a lot there are a lot of players, but fundamentally it was it was uh, Al Gilman's lab and and Marty Rodbell, Luke Bernbaumer groups um, that were the were the kind of the main contenders with a, with a whole cast of other players. I think you know the the field kind of you know we we sit back from from a distance now and you think ah oh, you know. Bob Lefkowitz did everything, and and he, I mean, he did a lot. I mean, there's, there's yeah. <laughs> one, one one cannot deny, you know. Um, but there was a race on for the receptors, so I kind of want to go through a little bit of, 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 of what what was going on with that because I think it's kind of interesting and and maybe a little bit uh, instructive, you know, for how how these things work. So, um, okay, yeah. So basically, the the what what all these groups set out to do was they knew that a variety of different hormone receptors could stimulate the production of cyclic AMP by adenylcyclase. And the question was, how does that work? Right. So it, it, is there a receptor, you know, as, as Rodwell had suggested, is there some kind of transducer protein turn out to be the G protein? How does, how does the enzyme work? Um, and the goal Kind of you know starting back in the seventies back back even when you know Bob was just starting his lab, um, the goal was really to purify all these proteins, not to clone them because molecular biology wasn't really there at that time. The goal was to 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 isolate all the individual components of the system and put them back together to make it work. Right. So yeah. could you purify a receptor? Could you purify this transducer protein? Could you purify the enzyme effector protein? Yeah. put them together and make it work and have it recapitulate what you see in a native cell or in, in a tissue. Um, so that, that's the goal they were working toward. And and once you had the pure protein and once molecular biology kind of caught up to where that was a goal, then poof, suddenly everybody who had any amount of protein purified wanted sequence to make probes to screen yeah. libraries. Yeah. Um, but, but just kind of keep that in mind. So their, their, their impetus was to prove basically Marty Rodbell's model is, is there a separate entity, the receptor, a separate entity, the transducer protein, G protein, and a separate enzyme yeah. as an effector? Um, so basically the, the important thing that allowed it all to work was being able to purify the receptor. And what that relied upon was affinity chromatography. And, there, and, and I kind of break it down into there are three, three things that you need to have receptor purification work by affinity chromatography, right? So first you have to have a ligand, right? That that So that's how you identify your receptor and that's also the, the hook you use for your affinity step. Um, and second, you have to have a place that your receptor is, so a tissue where you know that it is and it's at as high a level as you can get. But kind of a secondary consideration is it has to be a tissue that's available. Right. Okay. Um, and then da, 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 da. Uh, skip well, while while you look into into your notes, you know, you yeah. mentioned taking the different components and putting them together and see how this works. 
I was recently at the Discovery on Target conference and uh, Subterna was presenting. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, there were the native complex. I don't know. And I'm not sure from Subterna's perspective, what does that look like, the native complex? But this that you what you just mentioned, purifying all the components and have finding a way to see actually kind of thinking about blocks and Lego blocks and putting these things together and see what is the consequence of these pieces being put together. That's what it reminds me of. So, and mm -hmm. since it started out in, in Bob's lab and Bob's, uh, you know, coming out of, of the, of that team, it makes, I don't know, it, it makes sense to me, or there's a flashback here to what was then what you just mentioned and what is now. Right. Yeah. So I said three things. And, and and third thing was basically you had to identify a detergent to get your receptor out of, yes. out of the membrane. So okay. So and we'll kind of go through go through all these points kind of kind of individually. So so lots of people had you know had had their endogenous ligand for a receptor, right? So so Bob started looking at binding assays using ACTH. He got one of the very first binding assays to work for a hormone receptor back when he was at NIH. Right. So that's that was his initial claim to fame was actually getting that assay to work, right? But that's a peptide. And even today, I don't think there are very good small molecules for ACTH <laughs> um, receptors. So um, having having ligands that are amenable, right, are, are important. So you notice that Bob very quickly switched out of ACTH and then decided to work on adrenergics. And that, I think, was not an accident, right? So so the last episode, we're kind of going through the, the, the Nobel laundry list of, of how the field, you know, one, one is Nobel's, and there was kind of one oddball, and the what I but that included, and the reason I included is this: so Sir James Black won the Nobel Prize for basically medicinal chemistry and and rational drug design, and but what he what he actually did was design drugs for receptors, and specifically the beta adrenergic receptors. So he's the one who made isoproteranol, he's the one that made propranolol, and a whole host of other you know, there are a whole bunch of other analogs. So those were all done in the 60s. So by the time Lefkowitz and others were starting to think, okay, can can we look at an adrenergic receptor? There was a really deep toolkit and it, it only got better over years as people kept looking for more and more ligands. So choosing what receptor to work on made a big difference, right? So all the people that decided to work on a peptide receptor, they pretty much were riding on the coattails of the people that were working on the ones that had you know natural kind of small molecule ligands because it's much easier to make a small molecule analog of a small molecule <laughs> right you can modify a catecholamine you can take away the catechol ring and make it more stable you, know, you can do things to yeah. it and, and that's that's relatively easy something i work with glucagon right so glucagon is a, is a 29 amino acid peptide and it its binding is very complicated. And so if the in the peptide, if you clip off one residue off the amino terminus, it doesn't work anymore. You clip off one residue off the C terminus, it doesn't work anymore. It needs both ends. <laughs> so that's a really long small molecule. That's not, you know, if you try to replace that with a non-peptide, which is why things like the the you know, Wigovi and you know, semaglutide, the GLP1 yeah. drugs are basically heavily modified peptides. Yeah. They're just made to be more stable because it's really hard to try and get a small molecule. I mean, I hear the people actually have now for GLP-1 small mole you know, molecules, non-peptides, yeah. um, but they're not going to be very small because of the way the, that those receptors work. Right? So, that, so that's one thing. So what, once you have a good ligand, right, then you can prove one, your receptor exists, which is right, that that seemed to be a, an issue at the early stages of the, of the field, right? Um, and then you can assess pharmacology. So you know how this ligand acts. Is it, it does it stimulate the adenyl cyclase? Does it inhibit? What 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 does it do compared to the natural ligands? Um, so one of the problems with with the adrenergic receptors is the natural ligands, epinephrine, norepinephrine, or adrenaline, noradrenaline, depending which side of the pond you're on. Um, they're catechols. And so basically they're they're very, very oxidizable. And so we usually use isoproteridol as to stimulate the beta receptor, just because it's it's more stable. But even that, traditionally, we'd we'd make it in a solution of water and ascorbate to, as, as an antioxidant to keep it around longer. So the normal ones, you know, it's like uh, you know mayfly in a trout stream; <laughs> just they go away kind of instantly. Um, and, and kind of a you know kind of interesting sidelight on that. So it turns out that we've had we've known about bias ligands our whole lives and just didn't realize it. 
right? So on the beta beta two receptor, epinephrine and norepinephrine are not the same, <laughs> right? There actually there's a little bit of bias between the two. It's just everybody who studies it uses isoproteranol for convenience. So that we just that's we assume that's our 100 normal signaling, but there is no such thing as isoproteranol in the body, right? It's it's epinephrine norepinephrine. Yeah. So yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> and people, you know, people have to kind of think about it that way. It's like, oh yeah, that's true. Um, and we don't so I, typically. And typically, yeah. we don't because we just use the tool that works. And tool, it's yeah, right. right, exactly. And, and and yeah. So anyway, so so starting out, of course, so when when, when Bob started his own lab, and this this would have been back when he was uh, in, in Boston, um, they wanted to make a, an, a ligand for adrenergic receptors in order to do binding assays. So what do you think they did? Well, they tritiated norepinephrine, of course. Why, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the the first several papers from the Lefkowitz lab, where they're looking at binding assays using tritiated noradrenaline, uh, are contentious. <laughs> it's okay. Let's put, let's put it that way. <laughs> there were there were many people that believed that it was a complete artifact, and 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 there's some reason that that might be true, because they did binding assays, and when they tried to do specificity, by now. You know, so now you do a binding assay. You you add your hot ligand, and then you add a competitor, and you can yes. add different concentrations of competitor, and you get dose response curves and all that. So if you do that using norepinephrine as the tracer, mm -hmm. some of the ligands do not act the way you expect as competitors. Okay. And and the thought was at the time, and it's, and it's probably true that the norepinephrine was getting oxidized, and it was either binding to different things. Or through some kind of redox, redox reaction, it was actually binding to covalently other things. So they realized the problem pretty quickly, and and that's when they started looking at other things as tracers, and finally settled on tritiated alprenolol, which you can still buy. I, I I have some in the freezer, right? It's, <laughs> it's still you know a perfectly good, nice, stable molecule, right? Uh, a lot of people like to use. Uh, Iodinated iodocyanopindolol as their tracer, but it doesn't last as long because the half life yeah. of iodine plus it's a stronger isotope, so it yeah. breaks it yeah. down faster. So, so it's still it's still a very useful ligand. So, with a, with tritiated alprenolol, they're now it looked good, right? So they're able to get good binding. It's competed by all the right things. Right. Everything everything looks great. Um, alprenolol also had the advantage that if you do kind of your own, you know, kind of a little bit medicinal chemistry on it, you can find a place on it where you can put on a linker to attach the alprenolol to a bead, right? So that's what Mark Rohn did, was figure out how to do affinity chromatography using alprenolol. Um, but <laughs> people, people in our field seem to think that, oh, they, they invented affinity chromatography for receptors. And that's not really true. So... There's another guy who, who who was working for Burroughs Welcome named Pedro Quattro Casas, who did invent affinity chromatography, <laughs> and he would he, did, he was working on the insulin receptor. So he he had figured out a way to hook up insulin to a bead, and he could he could pull out insulin receptor not well enough to purify it, but enough to show that it actually was binding a physical protein. And this yeah. was several years before uh, the same thing was done with beta receptor. Um, but anyway, so but but the idea was around. Okay, so you you, you can attach your ligand to some kind of a, a substrate, and use that as a tool to pull out your receptor. And it has it has two advantages: one, it recognizes your receptor, and two, you know that receptor had to be functional at the time it was binding. Yeah. So a lot of the purifications, even 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 late, probably still, um, they always include an alprenolol step. So you can do other things to purify your receptor, but you want to finish with an alprenolol step. So you throw away all the misfolded ones. And you keep the functional ones, right? So that that's um, so now they had their assay, and they 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 had you know they had a they had a ligand, and they had a, a way to tether it to a, to a bead. Um, but now the question is, okay, where where are you going to purify it from? So so now you have an assay. They screen lots and lots of tissues and and lots of crazy things because what they settled on, and you've heard little pieces of this in some other podcasts, was frogs. I was going to mention, I, I remember something vaguely about frogs being oh, yeah, frogs. <laughs> taken yeah. home or, or, or some <laughs> interest, interesting stories, which things that you can't do anymore today, but still. Right. So so it turned out that that apparently the, the binding was way higher in Xenopus red blood cells. So they were importing all these frogs just to bleed them. 
to get the red blood cells. Um, and so, so you'll, you know, stories, various people on the podcast, right. Of, you know, frogs coming in boxes in the regular mail in the mail room, screaming to come pick them up and having to go, <laughs> you know, hose down the frogs to water them over the weekend. And then I, you know, Kathleen Caron told a story about when she was a kid coming into the lab and playing with the frogs. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, that, that, that was their source of, of beta receptor for quite a long time. Um, but eventually that, you know, they kind of got to a scale where that was not working. And at some point they switched to hamster lung. And I, I don't know how you, I mean, they, they would get boxes of frozen hamster lungs. And I just, somewhere out there, there was a company that was, you know, ripping little, you know, rip your lungs out, rip your lungs out of little hamsters. <laughs> I don't know, a hamster. I mean, where does that even come from? I mean, I, who... I, I, yeah, I, 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 that's a story I do not know, but I, I but that's what they, that's what they use. Some of the other ones I, I do know, right? So again, so they they were not the only lab doing purification, right? So uh, the other lab that was doing purification was Al Gilman, and Al had this guy Elliot Ross, who you've heard a little bit about, who yeah. was the one that actually purified GS, and he decided to start purifying receptors. And they were, they thought, oh, red blood cells. Okay, we can, we can do that. They worked with turkey red blood cells. And the reason was because there was a turkey processing plant not too far away in Dallas. So they could get a lot of turkey. Yeah. Blood. Wow. Um, so they're trying to purify, you know, the, the beta receptor from, and, and they did. And we'll get, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but there are other, other, you know, weird, weirdo sources out there, right? So I, 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 last time I told the story when you're we purifying G proteins, um, the burn bomber lab was using outdated human red blood cells to purify GS. Um, and, you know, kind of in the, in the, in the age of AIDS, it was a little scary how much they, blood they would go through. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so basically having a source for your molecule, that's, that's, it's a, it's got a good amount of the thing you're looking for, but also yeah. it's accessible. Right. So rhodopsin wins hands down, right. Because there's not a lot of retina in an eyeball, but, all the all the visual people use bovine retina and you know i like steak lots of people like steak so there's an unending supply of bovine retinas yeah um, and rhodopsin's almost pure as it comes right it's you, you know you can get a source that's got more receptor in it than that yeah so i have, have to have a good source so that, that that's that um and then the the other thing is that you have to be able now you got a, you got a receptor it's in the membrane and you got to remember people didn't realize how much of the receptor was actually in the membrane, right? So if you're trying to purify the insular receptor, it's got one little membrane span, you know, and then, yeah. and then otherwise it's a, it's a stably folded domain protein with membrane span. All the GPCRs, they are membrane span. <laughs> yes. Right? Which is interesting, but causes a lot of problems for, for purification and crystallizing. And that's, you know, it's always been a thing to overcome, um, but people didn't realize this, of course. So, you know, finding a detergent that allowed you to get those receptors out of the membrane in a state where they were still competent to bind the ligand was a an endeavor and lots of labs screened every kind of crazy thing i mean you know digitonin is the thing they finally settled on in the Lefkowitz lab and apparently there was the one magic lot of, of digitonin that was yeah <laughs> we've heard about this one the bottle of digitonin yeah, yeah. with a specific um, lot that was kept secretly i think in and i think mark's Mark's lab, Mark's office. Yeah, and 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 we kind of think, oh, digitonin, oh, that's a detergent, but it it it's not. I mean, it it is, but it's not. It's it's a you need a lot of it for it to be acting like a detergent. It's not, you know, it's not like SDS. That's yeah, you know, not um, the they screened a lot, a lot, a lot of things, and now it's it's a lot better, right? So there, there, people have designed kind of very weird, you know, molecules that act as detergents, and mm -hmm. so. People are able to purify receptors in a functional state, you know, lots of them now. So that's why, you know, that's like what what structures came out this week <laughs> because it's, it's a lot easier. But at the beginning, there was only digitonin and it took a lot of work to, to sort that out. Um, so basically now, so the Lefkowitz lab had, you know, a good, a good, a good assay. They had um, a reasonable, I mean, I would say it's a good source, but it was a, for them at the time, it was a good source of yeah. starting material and they had a way to get the receptor out of the membrane so they can start purifying it. So when you're purifying something from the membrane, right? So the first step is easy. You make a lysate and you spin it down. Yeah. The membrane protein is about 10% of the cell protein. So boom, you just make a lysate and spin it down. You've, you've got 10, you know, tenfold purification instantly. Yeah. <laughs> 
which which is actually a good trick. I mean, I, I've used this a lot of times. If you're trying to see something like a receptor on a Western blot or any other membrane protein, mm -hmm. don't look in a lysate. Make make your lysate without detergent. Spin it down. Resuspend the membranes in a detergent buffer, repo buffer, whatever it is. Do your Western blot on that, and that way you're ten times more likely to see your pant. Exactly. Exactly. So anyway, so they so they had these three components, and now now they started to do the purification. Um, and, and it took, you know, a lot of postdocs, a lot of years to, to, to get it to really work well. Um, and they, you know, along the way, again, they, they switched from using, you know, frog red blood cells to doing hamsters um, and hamsters seemed, it, it, it just, it seemed to work better for whatever reason. So finally they got some of the purified receptor. And as I said at the beginning, what, what the goal was originally was to reconstitute it, to get the system to work with just pure proteins. Yeah. So, this was, I guess, published in 1984. Um, so Rick Serione, Rocco, um, who, who was in, uh, in in Bob's lab, was the recipient of all these gift packages. So from his own lab, they purified the hamster beta-2 adrenergic receptor. And then from the Spurn Bomber's lab, they purified NS. If you look at the papers, it's always NS, but a GS uh, from human red blood cells. And then... Um, from even near and Harvard, adenyl cyclase, which was less pure than the other proteins, but still yeah. substantially pure. And she, she purified from, from brain. I'm trying to remember what it was. I think it was cow brain, but anyways, from brain. Um, but it's all different species, right? So, so basically, you know, Rocco has a story that you know, he's, he did this Frankenstein experiment because he put together the hamster receptor, the human G protein, and I think the cow adenyl cyclase okay. reconstituted into a vesicle and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> so they were able to make the system work. So you could add, you could add a hormone, you, as long as it was GTP around and ATP and a little bit touch of magnesium, you get wow. cyclic AP coming out the other side. So that's all you need, the three proteins. Um, so in the meantime, right, so what, once the Lefkowitz lab had, had a workable purification going for the beta-2 receptor, they also, in the background, were also working on the other adrenergic receptors. So they, they were purifying the alpha one receptor, yeah, only one because they only knew about one, <laughs> and and the you know beta, so beta one, beta two had been known, but but alpha was alpha one, and there was alpha two, only one at the time, and they were purifying alpha one and, oops, sorry, I need to... no worries, I, I find it fascinating phone. when I, you, I, you you my, put... my phone started buzzing and, and I had my phone off, but my computer. Oh, yeah, no. yeah, picked up. Yeah, yeah. No worries. We couldn't hear it. So, but okay, then good. while 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 you were doing that, I was just thinking, oh my god, you just you purify these proteins from different sources, mm -hmm. you put them together, and it works. I mean, well, it, isn't it beautiful? Sure. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. So anyway, so so basically, the the Lefkowitz lab is also purifying the the alpha one receptor and the beta two. I mean, and, and the alpha two receptor, um, and alpha one. That's right. Alpha one's coupled to phospholipase C, which that 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 whole mechanism was very fuzzy, and GQ was not really identified at that time. So it was, it was a little it was a little tough. But they he also re, you know he also reconstituted the alpha two receptor with human red blood cell NI or GI that Bomber Lab had purified plus adenyl cyclase, yeah. and was able to reconstitute receptor stimulated inhibition. Of a dental cyclase, so both those things they're able to do. So that that's uh, that's like 1984, 1985, um, and that was really the whole, the holy grail. So this, this this basically confirmed Marty Rodbell's original model for how the system worked, yeah. um, and that's kind of you know the the golden age of receptor biochemistry, as it were. It just that 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 was they they were done, you know. <laughs> I love it. Right, but in but in the meantime, right. So now molecular biology had kind of come of age. Um, and so now people started to turn their attention to cloning, right? So th those that had some sequence, now they had some some work to go with, yeah. Um, but anyway, so um, basically with, with the receptor sequence, um, they are able to get a little bit of peptide sequence, make some degenerate oligonucleotides, and go fishing. And the problem was, basically at that time, cDNA libraries were not very good. So they didn't have a lot of depth of coverage. And, and if you... If you look now, now it's all you know, uh, um, you know, transcripts per million from like RNA seq experiments or whatever. Um, the receptors have very low 
RNA levels. So they weren't finding anything, they weren't finding anything, they weren't finding anything. Um, and this was, you know, kind of some of the best people in the world, right? So this was, this was the, the group at Merck that was, you know, Richard Dixon, Kathy Strader, yeah. and Siegel. Um, and they just weren't getting to work. Um, and then Brian Kabilka had the idea, hey, you know, I, I don't know, you know, it's just not working. Let's try something different. I just want to see if I can get a piece of the beta receptor gene. I'm going to screen a genomic library because I know it's there. It's the, it's the same one gene, just like all the others, it's there. Yeah. And I'm just going to get a piece of it, or I'm just going to get an exon, but I'll have the actual exon sequence instead of a guess with the degenerate probe. Yeah. With that, we'll have a better probe to go fishing in a seeding library. So he screened and they found a clone and they started sequencing. And, you know, of course, it sequence just kept on going because there are no introns. <laughs> yeah. So poof, they were done. <laughs> so basically that, that that bright idea of let's 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 try something different let's go look in the genomic library see if we can just get a piece that'll help us on oh, the rest yeah. solve their problems immediately solve their problem so with that they 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 had their sequence and that that was uh published in 1986 and basically the beta receptor looks for all the world just like rhodopsin so wow or all receptors do <laughs> yeah yeah class a definitely have the same, yeah the same feature is interesting yeah. But okay, so so that's 1986, right? So as I said, there was, there was a race going on for trying to purify and clone receptors. Um, so also in 1986, the, the Elliot Ross and, and Dallas working together with Axel Ulrich, who was you know, the king of cloning at Genentech, uh, which is the feared Genentech group, <laughs> <laughs> uh, also reported the sequence of the turkey beta receptor. And it's not it's not a beta one and it's not a beta two. It's kind of turkeys a little you know birds are a little different. They don't have beta one, beta two. They just have beta. So yeah. the, the sequence of the turkey beta receptor was also published in 1986. Wow. So, but not only that, <laughs> there was another group, uh, uh, Shosaku. Get the name right. Da, 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 da. Yeah, Shosaku Numa uh, in Japan had been purifying muscarinic receptor from pig brain. And they got some sequence. So <laughs> they they identified the M1 muscarinic receptor and they got a clone and sequenced it. And they published in 1986 as well. And then they noticed something funny. And of course, all, all these receptors, they all, they all look like Rhodopsin, right? But they noticed something funny. So they, they had a bunch of peptide sequences and when they looked at all their peptides, trying to match them to where they were in their receptor, there were some that weren't there. But they looked very similar. So I said, that's weird. I wonder if there's a second one out there. So they took those other peptides, made new probes, screened again, and got the M2 receptor. <laughs> so 1986, no GPCRs at all. Dolphson, you didn't know it was a GPCR. Beta 2, turkey beta, M1, M2. <laughs> it, it's interesting. You know, when I think about, a G, especially, okay, let's, let me track back for potentially my generation and afterwards, when you go to Uniprot and you're looking up a GPCR, or you're thinking about working on GPCR, it is highly likely that you're thinking about a human GPCR. Oh. Right. Not a turkey or, you know, pit, whatever yeah. other species. So just listening to you telling these stories kind of puts things into perspective as to we didn't have the tool. So we had That's to right. use tissues yeah. to purify the protein to actually prove that if you put the components together, mm -hmm. things happen. And then and then cloning happens. Then you, only. Right. Right. And then and once you have a sequence. Then yes. some of the same groups, and then some other groups jumped in to clone them from other species. Exactly. So people want, you know, it, well, not at this time, but later people would want the mouse version in order to make knockouts. Yes. Right. Study physiology in mice. Um, other people would immediately go, "Oh, I want, I want, I want the human sequence," because I'm, you know, all, all the drug companies. I mean, it's, it's so we. The Lefkowitz lab went and went and cloned several, and then and then there are subtypes too, right? So people didn't know that there was alpha one ABC, you know, alpha two, ABC, you know, beta three wasn't known, right? So there are all these subtypes, um, 
And once once those were identified, and then you got the human versions. So in the Lefkowitz lab, they cloned many of these, the human version, and then they would license them out to pharma for a lot of money, a pretty penny. They made a, they made a, you know, and so they they kept us our lab meeting in uh, donuts and croissants and pizza <laughs> for a long time because that's slush fun from all the all the licensing fees for all the human versions of the other receptors but anyway yeah again that gets back to the beginning right so you'd have a source right so yeah nobody really i mean so some people were actually using human red blood cells and i'll tell you in a second that that that, that um other other human tissues were, were were also being used but for the most part you're working in a model organism because that was just what was accessible right um so people kind of think back and say, oh, fr from that beginning, then it was just this immediate kind of explosion of receptor identification. But actually it was kind of a, it was kind of a slow start. It took a, it was a lag. It took a couple of years to kind of catch on, right? Um, so that was 1986. So in 1987, um, the Lefkowitz lab had purified the alpha two receptor and got some peptide sequence and screened the library. Um, and that was the first alpha two, there are three uh, subtypes, but that was the first one. Um, and they also identified the first orphan, right? So um, they took the beta-2 receptor sequence and screened a library from a different tissue. And I, I'm, I'm blanking on what the other one was, trying to find, they, are, they knew that there was beta-1 and beta-2, so they wanted mm -hmm. to get the beta-1. And they found a clone that they called G21. Um, and it was not the beta-1 receptor. And they're like, I don't know what this is, but GPCRs were so new it's like, you know, several years ago, if you had a structure, it didn't matter. You get it on, in nature, right? Yeah. People were so new as, as clone things. They got this orphan published in nature. Mm -hmm. And then the next year, they got a second paper in nature saying it was a serotonin receptor. Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> not any other. Was, it was a serotonin. Wow. <laughs> well, of course, because there's so many of those. It's hard, it's hard not to be a serotonin receptor. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the interesting thing they did is that now they took this, this G21 clone and they screened a library with it. And they found a clone, and that turned out to be the beta one receptor that they published, I guess, in 1988 or 87. Mm -hmm. um, so that was basically all. You know, at, at that point, nobody else purify really purifies a receptor, gets a peptide sequence, and clones it. That's that's almost done with at this point. Now it's like it's all it's all homology based screening, yeah. and that's when it kind of really takes off. Um, so. Looking back in the literature, so the 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 term G protein coupled receptor first appears September 1987 <laughs> wow. in two different papers, one one by the Lefkowitz lab and one by uh, Gary Johnson. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and, and at that point, it's like people real realize, ah, yeah, there's a coherent there's a name for this thing. Yeah, <laughs> the the beast thing. has a name now. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So. So now basically they have, you know, an alpha one and alpha two, the two beta, beta one, beta two. Yeah. Um, and now people start poking around and they find, oh, wait, there are more. <laughs> so, you know, it turns out there are, there are three alpha ones, there are three alpha two adrenergic receptors, there are three beta receptors. Um, you know, there are five dopamines, five muscarinics. 16, 17 serotonin. I lost count. I just see. Was... So there, are, there are all these subtypes that that there was no pharmacological evidence for. Yeah. So yeah. now people were, you know, there, there was a big explosion of of people working on expression of cloned receptors to analyze their functional effects. Function, what is, what yeah. is their pharmacology? What is their physiology? Yeah. Um, so that kind of changed. <laughs> You know what 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 was going on there? So, um, do, 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 do. is there a time? Do you remember? I I you may not have the answer to this, but I'm wondering because you mentioned so all of these first clo cloning a receptor meant having a nature paper, especially in the beginning. Oh, for sure, absolutely. How yeah. how many receptors were there? Were there cloned or known until it didn't before before it, it dribbled it, down to it, GBC? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's like I, I see structure papers now in. You know, journals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, yeah, so, absolutely. So it happens, yeah. I wonder how how many how many of those receptors, how I, much I, time? I, 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 I'm I'm sure it didn't take too long. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't I couldn't tell you specifically, it, and it's hard to look, you know, because if you go back to the literature, you almost have to search by someone's name. And yes. The, the, yeah. The term GPCR 
isn't even in many of the, yeah. the European papers. So it's hard to, yeah. it's kind of hard to search. Just like if you wanted to search for, you know, the old, old protein, you know, old, old papers on like G proteins, you, you hit a limit where the, it, the name G protein isn't used anymore. And then it's like G slash F or NS or you know, some other term. Um, and yeah, yeah. so. Interesting. But yes, it, 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 that, that certainly happened. Can I ask you for a favor? Please subscribe to our Dr. GPCR YouTube channel. Many of you come back regularly to watch our videos, like the monthly video edition of the newsletter, but aren't subscribed. Having more subscribers will help us get you more content. Thank you for joining us and listening to this Dr. GPCR podcast episode. We would like to thank you for listening, thank our guests for joining us, and also would like to take a moment to thank our team members, Attila, Ines, Monserrat, Ivana, Andreina, and Balint. A huge thank you to our Dr. GPCR ecosystem partners, Domain Therapeutics, GPCR Therapeutics, Design Pharmaceuticals, Montana Molecular, and Orion Biotechnology. If you like our podcast, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can also leave us a testimonial at drgpcr.com slash testimonials. You can also subscribe to our monthly newsletter delivered directly to your inbox by visiting ecosystem.drgpcr.com slash newsletter dash sign dash up. Another way to support us is to share your favorite Dr. GPCR program with your network and colleagues. Email us with any questions or suggestions at hello at drgpcr.com. Until next time, stay safe.